telling me that it's connecting to the server, so I think we're good. Okay, so um, I, I do have my chat window up as well, um, so I will be looking at that periodically in case you guys have entered in some questions on there. Um, but again, you know, like I said, this is very informal, so please um, ask any questions. Just unmute your phone and ask any questions as we go through here. I'll be asking you periodically as well. Um, one other thing I wanted to make note of is that we will be rescheduling that last payroll session. Um, Lori had um, a, a family emergency last week, but um, we will get something scheduled um, here probably within the next week or two um, and get that last session scheduled for payroll. Okay, so um, where we're starting here is right now I'm currently at the home menu and I'm in my demo account. So um, it's got a lot of uh, extra stuff in here, which is good. You know, we can kind of look at some of these things. Uh, but you'll notice too, right up in the right-hand corner, it has the per period that I'm currently in. So kind of old, it's back in January of 2018, but it tells me right away um, where I'm at um, processing-wise. So I may have other periods open, and we'll talk about that more when we, get, when we get into posting periods. But this is my current period. So if I go and look up um, a particular budget account, an expenditure account, and I look at the month-to-date amounts, those month-to-date amounts are my January amounts. So um, if I wanted to see what they were in December, um, I, you know, by looking it up through in a, a particular account, I would have to go and make December current. I don't have to open it, but I can make December current, go back and look at that account, and I'll see December's figures. So that's, that current is, you know, basically your, your, your working period here. Um, so like I said, I'll get into that further when we get into the posting periods. <clears throat> so when I log in, the first thing I'm going to see is my home screen here. And this is going to either show all the SSDT reports or if I have created some custom reports and I have marked them as favorites, by default then it will show me my favorites. So obviously if I did not have any custom reports that I had marked as favorites, I would see the entire listing of reports um, by default. Um, but I have created some reports and I have bookmarked them, so that is what I'm seeing here. So obviously um, the reason why you're bookmarking them is to make them easily accessible. So I'm just going to jump over just to show you uh, where this is coming from. So when I click on report and go to report manager, um, you're going to see down here, if you look at the favorite column, all the different reports that are marked as favorites. These are the reports that are appearing in the home screen. So what you know, we tell users is, the end user is, if there are reports that you use on a daily basis or several times a day or on a weekly basis, check mark them as favorites so that when you log in and you're automatically on the home screen, those will appear. Now, obviously, if I wanted to see all my reports, I could click on this button up here, show all reports. This is a toggle. So this will toggle me back and forth between just my favorites or all the reports that are out there in the report manager. And these are just templates. So these aren't any canned reports that are out there. These are just your template reports that you have out there. Um, so obviously, I clicked on show all. And if I went back to my report manager and took a look at, at everything that's sitting out here, that's what this is. So it's just an easy way to get to your reports. So I'm going to click on show only favorites again just to show my favorites. So just something to, um, you know, let your, your uh, end users know about this. You know, uh, this training is designed, one, for you guys to feel more comfortable in the software, and two, to show you these things that you can pass on to your end user um, for helpful tips and tricks to share with them. So that's, this is definitely one of those that I would share with them. Um, because really what you're trying to do is make each of these screens in here as customizable as possible for each user 
so that they can get, you know, get the full advantage of every screen and what's out there that makes sense to them. So we'll be talking about customizing grids and all that stuff here in a little bit. So that's about it for the home menu here. Um, <clears throat> And also, one thing to keep in mind, too, it does say who created these. So obviously, all of these were created by the SSDT. Um, so if a user went in and created a report, obviously, their username would be underneath here. That's just another indication for the end user to know which ones are theirs and which ones are ones that they saved as favorites um, that are the SSDTs. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to get into this afternoon is the core menu. And so my privileges are set up that I have ad administrator access. So I'm gonna be able to see everything. Um, so obviously we can change the different roles and you're gonna see less options in the menu. But for the purposes of this training, I wanted to make sure that I had admin access so that you guys could see all of this. Um, obviously if I, had changed it to just standard access like an end user, I may not see all of the options in each of these menus. So just one thing to keep in mind. So I'm gonna go back to core here. And the first thing I wanna get into is accounts. So your core menu is basically your maintenance um, type or you know setup type of options. Um, so, like core, that would make sense. That's where all my account information is at, whether it's a cash, expenditure, revenue, or appropriation account. Um, my organization, that is some of the options in Classics USA Con. My vendors, um, so that would be like the vendors option in Classic or Venscreen. Um, so these are basically the core. Some of these things you won't get into, or you're the end user won't get into very often. Um, a lot of this stuff obviously is migrated over during the import. So for example, the OPUs, those all would be imported in um, from you know, classic into here. So it's not something that they have to go back in and reset. Obviously, same thing with accounts and a lot of these other options. Um, so um, there really isn't too much to be done setup-wise because everything gets migrated over. Um, but uh, let's go back into a, accounts here and I'll show you the different options in here. Um, what I like about the accounts um, grid and the accounts UI is that everything is right here in different tabs or buttons, however you want to call it. Um, so before, um, like in USAS Web, you would go to account, then you click on, like, is this a cash? Is this a, you know, expenditure? This is revenue. Um, instead, they're up here labeled here, and this is far better than um, account screen. Um, so account screen, you'd have to do like an actual search and pick like enter in a particular account in order to get in here. So this is much better, a definite upgrade from account screen. So the first tab that it defaults on is the fun tab. So let's talk about that one first. So when I go into the fun tab here, um, obviously, we're going to see um, that it's all set up in a grid style format. And here again is where users can go in and tweak um, their grids. And I'll talk about that when we get into maybe the expenditure tab and stuff like that so we can have some fun and, and play around with some adding some uh, different options on there. Um, but for the fund, there isn't a whole lot to display on here. Um, the reason, one of the reasons why um, we have the fund tab is setting up um, particular settings in here so that when you run certain reports like your certification reports, um, this stuff's already set up ahead of time. So I wanna go into that and show you that. Another thing is just to see a fund as a whole. So if you wanted to see the entire balance of all your 200 funds, and maybe an end user has, you know, 20 of them. Um, but they want to see the entire balance for that fund and not for the fund special cost center, they could click on this 200 fund and take a look at those balances. So I'm going to pick on the general fund here. And obviously what you're going to see consistently through all of the grids is a view and you're also going to see um, an edit in a lot of the uh, grid options. I'm going to click on view and that's going to bring up this particular general fund here. 
And obviously this would be all my 001 funds. So if I've got an 001-9000, 001-9002, 001 all these separate cash accounts that all are included as part of the general fund, they would all, those total amounts would be listed in here. Um, so in here, what you're gonna see, and I'm just gonna click on edit here just so you can see things a little bit better. So obviously, um, I've got some options up here, and this is where I was talking about how these things can be set up in here, and then when you run your certification reports, um, it will look at some of these settings in order to pull them in correctly. Um, so for this first one here, um, it says include in resolution. What this means is it's going to be included in the appropriation resolution. So by default here, it's checked. Um, so when you run the appropriation resolution report, the general fund's included in here. For the, For the I'm sorry, was there a question? Okay. So for the, uh, if you guys could mute your phone, if you don't have a question, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, for the certificate reporting, um, this is for um, like your uh, cert bell uh, and your amended cert certificate. So those, again, are underneath the periodic menu, and there's a cert certification option in there um, where you can run your certificate report or your amended certificate. So when you're doing that, based on what you have set in here, that's how it's going to appear on the report. So do you want it to appear as fund special cost center or by fund? So that's what this is for. And then down here, are your other options for the appropriation resolution. Now, when you run your, your appropriation resolution, um, you can go in and specify, like if you think about the classic one, I think the last screen on the appropriation resolution had the different resolution le levels in classic, where you could select, do you want it by fund? Do you want it by uh, fund special cost center? Do you want the, the first digit of the function, second digit and object? How do you want that to appear on the report? Well, we put that into just this inside the fund here so you don't have to go in and select that every time you run the report. It's set in here one time so that you run the report, it looks here to see what are my reporting levels. Um, and so these can be changed at any time as well. So in here, if I just wanted this to my resolution for the you know, general fund, to be by fund special cost center, um, that would be checked. But maybe for my 200 funds, I just want it by fund level. Then you would just check mark fund. So again, very similar to what you're seeing in those classic reports when you ran the appropriation resolution and the certificate and amended certificate. Um, down here, so again, this information up here pertains to the certification uh, report. Down here is just an FYI of what are my total amounts for this fund, and it breaks it down by fiscal year, the current month that I'm in, which is January, and my calendar year. Um, so it's just giving me my grand totals for that fund. So obviously, if I just, if I, like I said, if I had an 00100 and an 001901, those two would be combined in here. Um, if I just wanted to see those separately, I would have to go out to the cash button and click on that and be able to look at those um, separately. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and, um, and I'm gonna cancel out of here. And when we get into um, periodic uh, tomorrow probably, probably and talk about the certification reports, I'll go back to that fun tab Again, so you guys can make the connection between the two. Okay, the next one is the cash. We'll go into our cash. <clears throat> and so um, in here, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the grids and what you're seeing. Okay, so uh, obviously this is, these are our cash accounts. Um, so it's gonna display it here by Fund Special Cost Center here, and it's showing me from what I've customized on my grid, the amounts that I wanna see. Now I know that we've had some uh, people, some tickets come in about performance issues and maybe things being slow. 
um, between like moving from the cash to the expenditure account to the revenue, it just takes a little bit longer. Um, that could be dependent on how many columns of amounts you have on the screen, so on your grid. Um, so if you, like me, I have quite a few here. Um, and obviously, you know, we want to, you know, the user wants to see, you know, what's important to them. This might be overkill. Uh, maybe they just want to see, you know, what was my, what's my current fund balance and what have I expended and receded in, and that's it. Um, so the less that you have for the system to calculate, because remember, all of your amounts are calculated on the fly. So it's going back and looking at everything and totaling up these amounts that may impede performance. So um, that is something that we are aware of and that we are trying to, you know, ongoing basis, try to get this resolved so you don't have to limit the amount of um, amounts, columns that are on the grid. But for now, if you have end users um, that are complaining about um, the slowness, it could be all the different options that or amounts that they have on the grid. Um, so obviously, if I wanted to remove some of these, I would have to go underneath more. And more is going to have, I'm going to move my chat window out of the way here. Um, more is going to have all the different columns that you can put on your grid. Um, and then what you're going to see is I am going to get this so I don't have any expanded yet. So here's my default for cash account um, and the different properties or fields that I can pull onto my grid. Um, and so you're going to see a bunch of different ones. And so obviously when I click on code here, that's going to expand it. And these are my account code dimensions that I can put on here. Um, I can also say, you know, if I want to check to see is this account valid, I can click on this, on account valid, and it's going to pull that field or that property onto my grid. So these are different things that they can pull in, whatever makes sense to them. Um, and so if I don't want these broken down and I just, maybe I'm trying to save space, it might be a better example on the expenditure grid than in, than in here, but I could select full account code. And what's going to happen then is it's going to apply that full account code onto my grid. And I think and always when you add um, a new field to the grid, it's going to throw it to, at the end of the grid. So I'm just going to X out of here real quick. And you'll know it is full account codes over here. So it's always going to add it to the far right of your grid when you're adding on a new one. But I could just take this and I'm dragging it with my mouse and I'm pulling it way over here. And I could say, you know what, I'm going to make, oops, do a little bit more. I'm going to just use full account code and I'm going to get rid of the fund special cost center because I can go in here and query um, and like select just specific funds if I wanted to do that. So saving space, they don't do a lot of filtering on these. You could use the full account code instead of fund special cost center separating them out. It's purely a preference of the end user and what they want. So I'm going to uncheck full account code. And let's talk about some of these other ones that you're seeing in here. Um, amounts is another one. And so when I click on that one, it's going to show me um, all the different amounts that I can include or exclude. And so that's where I was talking about how um, this could be part of a performance issue is having a lot of different amounts on your grid. So if I wanted to, um, reduce that, I'm going to get rid of the unencumbered balance and I'm going to get rid of encumbrance and I'm even going to get rid of initial cash. So all I really want to show is my received, my expended, and what do I currently have as my fund balance. So if those are the only amounts I want to appear on here, I can get rid of the rest of those and just see those particular amounts on the screen. So again, these are just things that you really want to share with the end user um, so they feel more comfortable um, with adding and removing um, specific fields on their grids. Um, and then I can always just click on this again to get rid of all the options underneath amounts. 
and then we have account info. So this would be, you know, here's my description, here's my status, I'm active, um, anything else that I want to include in here. If I want the fund types to be listed so I know what type of fund it is, I can add that code option. It will display it on the grid. So lots of different things in here. Date range is really that is kind of misleading because we really don't have date ranges in um, cash accounts. We have start and stop dates though. Um, so if you know your user, if your district is a big user of start and stop dates, maybe they are with their grant accounts and stuff like that, and they want those pulled up on here, you can do that. Also, um, custom fields can be added in here as well. If there is a particular custom field they want created for the cash accounts, that's created underneath custom fields underneath the system menu, but then it can be added then as um, a property to put on the grid as well. So lots of different things that they can do. Okay. So that's what more will do. It'll just have them go in and add and remove um, whatever fields that they want. Um, and based on what's currently displayed, um, the end user can run a report. So this is going to pull whatever I have filtered and whatever accounts, or I'm sorry, whatever columns that I have displayed currently on my grid, I can pull all of that into a report. So if I click on report here, I don't have anything filtered right now. I've got all of my accounts selected, but obviously um, this report is only going to include fund special cost center description, the status, my received amount, my expended, and my fund balance because that's what's on my grid. It's not going to include everything that was underneath the more option. It's going to include just what's on my grid. And so you're going to see it has a lot of different options here. So I can go in and select whatever format um, is listed here. So lots of different things here. And um, it seems like the most popular ones obviously are PDF. Um, CSV is another popular one. Um, and then some of the Excel um, options down here. Now this Excel is more of an HTML, almost like a picture of a PDF in a spreadsheet. It's pretty, but it's not as useful as like using the CSV option. Um, so for those of you, for those that really want to treat it as a true spreadsheet, they would probably want to use CSV or use one of these Excel data um, or Excel field name options. Um, page size, pretty self-explanatory. Orientation, so if I'd rather this be landscape instead of portrait, because you know I have quite a few columns on here, I would do that. Um, the default name is cash account report, so obviously um, they can change that. And so this is the title that's going to appear on the report. Um, so here we've got um, summary, and we also have show report options. So the summary report uh, would be used, um, for one thing, the summary report should be used with the PDF format. Um, this will basically go in and summarize. So for example, for this one, it should, if I check mark summary, it's going to go out there and summarize all the 001 funds, give me a total amount, all the 002 funds give me a total amount, and summarize them by fund um, is what I'm thinking it's going to do. And same thing if I was writing a budget summary report for let's say all the 200 funds, um, it's going to instead of showing me every single budget account for every 200 fund, it's going to summarize it and just show me the totals for the 200 9001, 200 9002 for all the different special cost centers within that. So definitely something for um, the end user to play around with. But like I said, um, it looks that way on the PDF, but um, like the CSV file um, option won't summarize in that way. Um, so it's going to look just like what's showing on the screen here um, in, in a CSV format. Um, the show report option, um, we just added this not too long ago, a couple of releases ago, um, and this is basically um, the options page in Classic. 
So it's just showing what options you selected underneath generate report, what parameters were selected. Um, so obviously we really don't have any underneath here for this one, um, but I'll show you what other things. It's also going to show me what I selected up here. Um, and then obviously if I want to go and just generate my report right now, I can. If this is a report that I plan on using very often, uh, maybe I'm going to cancel out of here to show you something. Maybe I'm filtering this and I want to filter it for just my 200 funds. So here's how you do a filter. You just go in and start entering that information. And right now, if I go back to report, it's going to remember that I just filtered on those 200s. And again, I can do show report options. And then from here, I can say student activity 200 funds. And when I save this report, it's going to save it as a custom report. So I can access it at my home page or I can access it underneath the report manager. So I basically just created a quick report for my 200 funds. And that's what's really nice about this report option is that I can see, you know, districts, especially treasurers, using this quite often to get a quick and easy report of what's on their grid. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save this first. And it gives me a little informational message saying that I have saved it. And now I'm going to go ahead and generate it. So again, I'm going to change this back to landscape. I'm using PDF format and I've got the show report options. And so the first thing you're going to see obviously is my report options because that's what I selected. Um, and I didn't have any parameters, there weren't any for me to put anything in. It remembered, based on my grid filter, that I just selected 200 funds. Um, so that is in there. And actually what I'm going to take you to is after we look at this report, we're going to go look at it underneath the report manager so you can see um, how it, it's still going to remember those 200 funds. Um, but first off, you're going to see who created it, on what day and the time, and then what was at the top of that uh, menu option. And then obviously down here, I'm going to see all my 200s and everything that was on my grid. So one thing it does add as well is it does put in the current posting period, um, just an FYI, and also obviously the date and time. And so if I did change the title of my report, that would be reflected here, but I left that as is. And then obviously my grand total. So if I go back and I go into report, I want to show you where this report went to. And so these are my um, 200, my cash account uh, 200 student activity reports. And that is listed right here. So my student activity 200, I guess I had another one out there as well, but that's where this stuff is listed now. If I just go in and look at this, so I'm going to go and click on this, and this opens up the report definition. Um, and we'll talk about this in detail when we get to reports, probably Thursday. Uh, but these are all of the um, fields that I had selected on my grid. So again, remember I, I removed some, so all I really had left was the received, the expended, and the fund balance. Um, so it remembered that because that's what I saved on my grid. And then my filter, fund like 200. So if I wanted to go in and tweak this and add another fund, maybe it should have been 300 as well, I can go ahead and enter that in here um, and save and update my, my report. But basically, I just created that report with those filters based off of what I entered on the grid. And now I have this report that I can go in and run anytime I want to. Any questions on that? I'm going to go back to core and back to accounts and go back to my cash account. And because I got out of here and back in, obviously it's not going to retain what I had filtered, but it will notice retain um, the columns that I um, 
have. So I, I've customized my grid. I go out of the cache and go into something else, go into reports and come back in here. That type of information is going to stay. You, an end user doesn't have to recreate their grids every time they go in. Once they, you know, set it up the way they want it to, it's done. Um, unless they go back underneath more and select something else. Also, reset will take you back to the default. So I don't think, you know, every, I don't think people would want to do that because they lose their custom grid. Um, but if it's a mess and they just want to start over from square one, they could always click on reset and it'll take them back to the default properties. Um, talking about some of the other things that you're seeing in here, um, again, the filter row. Um, so there's lots of different ways to filter. You can use greater than or less than um, signs in here. Um, you can put in a range. So I can put in like a certain amount here if I wanted to and just pull up everything, you know, greater than $50,000 and it's going to show that information. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And so what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and filter this and just show me those amounts that are greater than 50, greater than, not greater than or equal, just greater than. If I wanted to change that, I could put an equal sign here. I doubt I have any that's just equals to it. Um, but that's what it's going to pull then. And again, if I wanted to create another report and say, you know, these are all of my cash accounts that I have spent, I have receded in $50,000 or more, I could click on report again and create a report off of this. So if I need a hard copy, this is the way to go. You know, filter it on the grids and quick generate a report. Um, we don't have totals down here. I know that's something that people have requested. And at this point, I know we have it um, marked as a JIRA issue, but I don't know what it's scheduled. Um, but for now, um, the workaround is to generate that report and get the grand totals from there. Um, a lot of the other um, filter rows, they are all listed underneath, I believe, our navigation um, options. Let me go into here. And if I go into the USSR documentation, underneath the navigation, um, there is um, different things in here. And one of them is grid. And when I click on grid, it's going to go in and um, it talks about how to customize the grid, stuff like that. So these are things that you could give to your end user. So they've got this information in there. Um, but one of the things that, you know, is listed in here is your filtering. So it has all the different values that you can use down here. So you're going to see all of those down here. Um, another one that I tend to use quite often is this one right here. Um, it's kind of a, it's called a not equals to. So if I want to see everything but um, a certain um, field, um, I can do, you know, not equal to, you know, $1,000, and it's going to show everything but $1,000 on the grid. Um, another one that I find myself using quite often is this value option. So I put in a beginning and ending. So a good example would be a date range. Um, if I'm in the, I use, I use the filters a lot in the activity ledger. So if I wanted to find everything for a certain month on the activity ledger or a certain week, I can put in like 0101 2018 to 0107 I'm sorry, 0101 2018 dot dot 0107 2018, and it's going to show me everything within that date range on the activity ledger. Obviously, you can do that with the other um, grids as well. Um, so you can do that with a lot of different um, values, but this kind of explains all the different filtering values that you can use. So, and it shows you you can use equals or you can use dot .eq, dot .gt. That's a little too techy for me. Um, I use, you know, equals, greater than, less than sign, but um, they can use either one. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do now is actually go into one of these cash accounts so you can see that it's very similar to what they're used to seeing in USAS Web. So I'm just going to click on my view. And again, like I said, a lot of these account um, or a lot of these icons, same icons will be displayed throughout all the grids. 
You're going to have a view. You're going to have an edit. Um, you may have a delete. Obviously, it depends on your level of privileges that you have um, and permissions that you have. So obviously, I couldn't go out there and just delete the general fund if I've got amounts in there. There are security features in the system that's going to prevent you from doing that. That would be a bad thing. Um, so you won't be able to do um, things like that. Some people may not even see this option based on the permissions that they have. So I just want to go ahead and view this. And um, so this is basically my cash account here. And so it's going to show me my account information. And so you're going to see um, a lot of these different things in here. Um, and then you can hover over some of these and you will get a tooltip as to what they mean. Um, so some of these will say like includes um, certificate, that's for the cer certification reports, things like that. Um, if they use cross-reference codes, um, those should get imported in from um, uh, the classic system. Um, so these are just some things, a lot of these things will already be set up because of what they were in classic. It's going to get imported in the same way. Um, the amounts, this looks very similar to what they're used to seeing in USAS Web or in account screen. You got your fiscal year to date amounts, your month, and your calendar. And then down here are some other, you know, future encumbered amounts. Um, pre encumbrances are your requisition amounts. So just new verbiage um, means the same thing, but instead of seeing requisition, they're going to see pre encumbrance. If I scroll down, also we have standard custom fields. And so, again, if they don't even want to see the custom fields on here, you could go into custom fields and disable these, and they won't even see these um, fields on the cash account screen. That is district-wide. So obviously, if the treasurer doesn't want those on here, no one's going to see them. So if we go in and change that and remove these custom fields, uh, one of the other users, they aren't going to see it either. So it's not specific to a person. These type of situations, it's district-wide when it comes to custom fields. Everyone's going to see them. Um, up here, you're going to see, obviously, to edit. And obviously, there's restrictions, just like there was in Classic. They're not going to be able to go in and edit and make changes to amounts or anything like that. Um, there is a clone feature, too. Um, so that's the same as what um, Classic had. And there is this cash adjustment. Now, I have Sysman Priv, so I'm seeing this, um, but uh, because obviously you're adjusting cash figures here, that's a big deal. Um, so, and, you know, the standard user is not going to be able to do that stuff. That's something that if you guys, you know, were in Classic, like if you think about account screen, how we had access to the July 1st cash balance, if we had to change that, which was very rare that that ever had to happen, but every once in a while, um, maybe an auditor, uh, there was a problem with balances and they wanted the beginning balance changed uh, for a particular, for a couple funds because the money should have gone out of, you know, into this account instead of that one. Um, there would be a request, a written request from the auditor to change that district's beginning balance. And so, with us having system manager access in Classic, we could go in and change the initial cash figure. Well, this is how you're going to do it in redesign. You're going to go to cash adjustments and make the change there. Now, I'm going to get into more detail about this when we get into budget adjustments because it's rare that you guys would ever go in here. I'm going to show you budget adjustments, which is very similar to the cash adjustments. But I want to show you budget because that's what your end users are going to be using quite often in order to do additions and deductions and things like that. But this cash adjustment will allow you to go in and make a change for a certain reason, like per an auditor's request. So that's why that's up there. Um, like I said, your standard users, your group manager users should not see this option when they're in here. They won't even have this capability. All right, I'm going to go ahead and X out of the cash account, and I'll just go ahead to appropriation. And obviously, these are going to be your appropriation figures. 
So one thing that people have asked is if I create a new expenditure account, does that automatically create my appropriation account like it did in Classic? Yes. So that's still going to, if that appropriation account is not already out there, it will automatically create the appropriation account. When you go in and make changes to an expenditure account, maybe you do an addition or a deduction and it affects the, um, the balances, it will also update the appropriation account balances as well. So um, those are still linked. Um, so in here, with my appropriation account, obviously you'll see the same type of stuff you were used to seeing in classic. Fund, function, object, and special cost center are the four dimensions that make up the appropriation account. And again, they can go in and add and remove um, you know, certain fields uh, to the grid. Um, and then they could go in and look at it Obviously, edit, there are only certain things they can edit, the description, maybe start and stop dates, stuff like that. They can't be going in and editing amounts or anything like that. Um, expenditure, I do want to get into that. And I want to do um, a budget adjustment and show you um, how that works in here. Um, so obviously, I do have um, all of my account code dimensions listed on my grid. Now this is where if they don't want these broken out, it just depends on the user and they just want to see the full account code, you could go underneath the more option and I think it's way down at the bottom here underneath account code and there is a underneath code, there is the full account code as well. Somewhere around here, there it is. Maybe I just went by it here. Oh, I totally, it's way up here. I was wrong. It's underneath codes. There's the full account code. And what, if I chose that and selected that, I'm going to see the full account code in one column. So. You may have a lot of districts that don't want to use that um, because they do a lot of filtering. Um, but it does save a lot of space, too, because when they pull in the full account code, it's going to take up half the space that these do. And they could still filter on it. Um, they could go in and say, you know, 001-11-5 to see any um, 001 fund with starting with 1100 function and starting with a 500 object. They could still do that, but it takes just a little more time, a little more brain power to try to get that where it's a lot easier if they have these out here just to go in and filter by each dimension. So that's just a preference, but it's always something good to show them in case they don't like this taking up most of their grid. So again, and that's the full account code option here. So I've got that, I've got the description. If I scroll over here, I've got some of my amounts here. So again, the more amounts they have on the grid, it might um, impede in, por in performance. So you just want to make sure that they have, you know, what they feel is the most important or something they're going to reference quite often. One thing I didn't uh, show you yet is the highlight view. I could go in and just click on one of these and it's going to pop up this highlight view off to the side and I'm going to get a lot of my amounts that way. So if they don't necessarily want them on the grid but they want easy access instead of having to go in and view it, they can just click anywhere on this row and it's going to bring up their highlight or the highlight grid and they can see most of those amounts. And then I can just click on X or if I'm using this a lot, leave it open and then click on the next one to see that information. So, but if I want to get rid of it, I just click on X to get rid of it. Um, so in here, I'm going to go ahead and scroll back over. One other thing I put on here is the forecast line number. Um, that's another thing. If they're looking at certain things, maybe they're running their forecast and they're like, uh, this doesn't look right or I, you know, I, this, these amounts should be on a different, you know, forecast line number, they could go out here and calculate their values by going out here and selecting anything that's on the 3.010 line 
and filter and generate a quick report and get a total just to see what amounts make up this forecast line number. So that's just another thing that I added um, on to my grid um, if I tend to go in and want to reference those forecast line numbers quite often. Um, again, you're going to see those same options that you saw before, view, edit, and obviously delete if they have the capability of deleting it. Um, we've also had a lot of people um, ask about um, certain rules to be created. I think the biggest ones that we've gotten so far are rules about requisitions. Maybe they don't want a requisition to be created without an attention line or they don't want a requisition created with a blank um, account code, stuff like that. Um, we can write rules to restrict certain things like that. We can do the same thing here. Obviously, if I just created an account um, and I have not done anything to it, I, I believe I can use the delete option to delete that account. Um, but if that's something they don't want to happen, you can create a rule to prevent that. So obviously, if I've already started budgeting against it, added some initial budget figures, did some expenditures, some encumbrances, I can't just go in and delete that account. It will not, the system by default will not let me do that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and click off of that. Um, and so let's go in and take a look at one of these specific budget accounts. I'm going to pick on a couple here. Um, let's just pick on... And again, this is my filtering. So I just want my general fund, and I just want objects starting with 510. So it's going to bring all those on here. I can filter this even more and just put in a T for true. Now that's another thing as well. You don't have to type out the entire word. A lot of these Boolean expressions here, you can just put in a T or F. Or when you're doing um, dates and things like that on reports, um, you want a date range of the fiscal year, uh, the beginning date, you put in F. Ending date, you put an L for fiscal. Again, we have all of those documented out there to show you all the different quick ways to enter that stuff in. So I'm going to go ahead and view this first one here. And it's going to bring up that budget account. And I'm going to expand this a little so you guys can see this better. I'm going to move. I know you guys can't see my chat window here, but to move it over so I can, you guys can see this. Okay, so in here, first off, obviously the account code's displayed and the different information about the account code. Is it active? Does it have a cross-reference code? Does it have start and stop dates? Here's my forecast line number. Um, again, if there's a custom field you want created and you want it underneath the account info, that stuff can be created underneath custom field and then added to those specific sections. So it's just something to keep in mind. You know, right now, a lot of the districts are just trying to absorb, you know, all of what's on these screens. But I think on down the line, once they get really comfortable with this, they're going to start asking those type of questions. We've got users already, like I said, asking about rules. And um, I think on down the line, they're going to start wanting custom fields and things like that. So just things to keep in the back of your mind. So in here, again, the amounts table looks a lot like classic. So you've got your fiscal year, your month, and your calendar. Now what you're going to see that's a little bit different is you're going to see, again, your gap original and your initial budget, carryover encumbrance, but instead of additions and deductions, those have been combined into an adjustments field. So it's not broken out here, but you can break those out on reports and I believe on the grid as well, and separate those out to say, I just want to see additions versus, you know, deductions. But on this table, it's combining them. And then your expendable, what you've spent, so encumbered minus future encumbered, encumbered, your requisition amounts to give you a remaining balance. Um, so in here, um, if, you know, what, what used to be, what it used to be is, um, districts had to use the add deducts option to make changes to their expendable amount. Well, that's no longer the case. We did away with that a few releases ago and added this budget adjustments. So this is adjusting your expendable figure. So if I click on budget adjustments, 
So you'll notice right away, this was the information that was imported in. And how do I know that? Because it tells me over here. So my description shows this came from my import. So I did this import on January 8th. Um, and so by default, when it, this data gets imported in, um, whatever that was in Classic, it was $14,000 was your initial budget then, and that was your gap initial. Obviously, those are going to get put in here as well. So this came over from the import. So I'm going to just pull this over so you guys can see this better. So right now, my expendable figure is $14,000. I don't have any adjustments at all. I haven't done any additions or deductions. What I want to do is I want to reduce this by, uh, let's say, $4,000. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Create. And so the first thing it's going to do is it does bring up this menu. I'm going to pull this over here so you see it better. And so obviously it's going to default to today's date. And that's, you know, that's what they're going to be in most of the time when they're doing their adjustments. But I'm going to back this up to whatever my current month that I'm in. And you'll notice, notice when I did that, when I tabbed off of there, it changed the transaction type. I already have an initial budget. It's smart enough. It knows that. What, it's, what I need to do is I need to make an adjustment. Now, if I just created this budget account and I need to add an initial budget, obviously I'm going to have that transaction type available. It's going to give me the initial to allow me to enter in an initial budget. In this case, I've got one. And so from here, I want to adjust that amount. So, and what I'm going to do, because this is a deduction, I'm putting in a negative. So a negative 4,000. And here, this is one thing I really like about this, and I think it's helpful um, to really promote this uh, for your treasurers um, and, and the end users, that they can document why they're doing this. Is it based off of board minute approval? They can put in the, you know, reference that. They can reference, you know, that their name or, you know, any reason why. Um, I know I had somebody ask um, just a couple of days ago, um, they have more than one person doing additions and deductions at their district. And uh, right now, you know, they're not sure um, easily how to they don't know who is entering that information. Is it user one or is it user two? Um, and so right now in the description, they're putting in, you know, user one and then putting in the description so they know that so-and-so entered this adjustment. What we talked about today at our team meeting is having the ability to somehow um, put in the created user or something like that to tie this in. I'm not sure if we're going to put it here or if there's just going to be a better way to pull up that information right now. I would think, <coughs> excuse me, that you could somehow run it through audits, but as we all know, the audits report out there right now is not pretty. Um, so to be able to do that easily and pull by created user, <coughs> excuse me, um, it might be easier to put something on here. Excuse me for a minute. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put some in here. <coughs> I'm going to click on post. Okay, and you'll notice now that that adjustment is showing here as a negative adjustment underneath my adjustments, and that changed my expendable amount down to $10,000. So it did do a deduction, um, and you'll see the information in here as well, <clears throat> that here is my adjustment amount. And again, I have my options here, um, my description, and I think when I click on this, I can't add and remove any of these if I don't want one of these columns showing. But you'll see here that I have it documented now that I did do an adjustment on this day. That's the day that was recorded. Um, and it made the adjustment. And one thing to note, too, it's going to update both your fiscal and your month to date. 
So that's basically how you do an adjustment. So same type of procedure <clears throat> with revenue accounts. So we do have the budget adjustments option in there as well. And they can go in and make adjustments on their revenue, on their receivable figures. Any other questions about budgets? Okay. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go to revenue. And again, <clears throat> here are all my different revenue accounts and I can go ahead and modify my grid um, um, for, you know, whatever benefits me. Um, one thing that I did not show you guys yet is how to create. So very simple. Um, once you get to the create button, you've got all these different options here. So obviously you can go in and um, this op these options up here, create new and close, you're going to see that in a lot of the transactions. It may not be something you use a lot with, with the account UI, but if you've got a stack of receipts that you need to do, um, you'll see you've got 50 sitting there. Um, what the end user can do is they can check mark this and click on create new. And what happens is when they go in and enter their transaction data and click on save, it's going to post that receipt and open up a brand new window and leave this window open so that you're ready to create your next receipt. If you don't do that, it's gonna display the receipt and then they would have to exit out of here and click on create again to do their next one. That gets annoying after a while. So that's why we added these in here so that um, it leaves that window open so they can process 50 receipts at once. Um, the other option is the close here. And so what happens here is after I enter in this information and click on save or post or whatever, um, it's going to close this window. Right now, it doesn't do that. If I go in, create this receipt um, account and click on save, it leaves the window open. So if I'm not a fan of that, I don't want that to do it, I can keep, I can click it on close, click on save, and um, Let's just go ahead and try this here. I'm just kind of going to make up a receipt code. Hopefully I don't have this one out there already. And I'm going to go ahead and click on Save. Ah, so I was afraid of. And I can see all the error messages too. <laughs> And it should go out there and it saves that receipt revenue code and you noticed it closed my window at the same time. Now if I go back and click on create, you notice that it stays. So that's the part I really wanted to show you. It's not like a, something you have to keep resetting. So if they're wanting to keep the window open um, most of the time because they have several, so like when it comes to your receipt processing, PO processing, stuff that you're doing a bunch of them at once, they're probably going to use the create new and keep that set most of the time. If you're in all of these other type of screens where eh, I'm not in here doing repeated um, adding, but I don't want to have to click on this every time I create a new account, click on close. That way then every time you create one, and you click on save, it's just going to remove the window altogether. Like I said, if you don't, it displays the newly added account, then you have to click on X to get rid of that. So that's what that create new and close do. Okay, any other questions about accounts at all? I don't see anything in the chat window. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, I did want to spend a little more time in accounts before, you know, we move on to the other options here underneath core. Um, so you just get a, a bit more comfortable with all the options. We'll touch upon some of these other things that you're seeing, like the advanced query. We'll talk about that when we get to vendors. Um, bank accounts is the next one. Um, so this is where you can go in 
and create bank accounts, separate bank accounts. Um, if, you know, I don't, we don't have a whole lot of districts that um, have separate bank accounts, but some of those larger districts do. Maybe they're general, you know, I'm just using a bad example, but maybe the general funds underneath one bank and some other um, funds are tied to another bank. And you want to separate those out because what happens is when you're ready to cut the check, when you're ready to do the disbursement, it will ask you what bank account is this tied to. And so you would put that in there and then you can run reports and things based off of those separate banks. So um, it's more of a convenience thing than anything um, for balancing. Um, we didn't really have anything like this in Classic before, so this is what I consider a new feature um, in the redesign. And so you'll see here, by default, you're going to see a default bank account, um, but if you want to create another one, it's just the, you know, going up to create, entering in that number, the description, you can not put start and stop dates, and you can make whatever you want the default bank account by checking on it. So you're just going to be able to have one default bank account. But what you'll notice is when you go in to do that payable um, or refund check, that you'll be able to select by bank account. I think it defaults, obviously, on the default bank account, but you can go at that point and select that. Delivery addresses. Okay, now with delivery addresses, when all your requisitions and purchase orders are imported in from Classic, all of those deliver to addresses get pulled in. So if you go and look at one of your districts, you may see a ton of delivery addresses because the system doesn't know enough to say you might have a delivery address that says the um, Sampleville School District. And you might have one that says Sampleville School District and another one that says Sampleville Schools. Really, those are all the same place, but the importer doesn't recognize that and it's going to make three separate delivery addresses and they're going to be all labeled and displayed in here. So like I said, um, you could have quite a few in here. They're all set as inactive by default. So what I tell districts is, I know this looks kind of daunting, but really just pull, check mark those addresses, those delivery addresses, deliver to addresses that your district is going to use. So if you have an elementary school, a high school, and a transportation building, check mark those three. So they'll go out and kind of scan them and see the one that has the correct address. They'll check mark those so that when you go in to create a requisition or a purchase order, you can select by that default address. So it's, it's kind of nice, actually, because once you have checkmarked the ones that you want, so I'm not going to have that one checked there, obviously. So I've got these two in here. Um, what happens then is when I go in to do a requisition, you'll notice this when we get into requisitions, um, when I get to do the delivery address information, I can just click on the down arrow and it's going to pull up these two, and that's what I'm going to see. Obviously, I can go in while I'm doing the REC or the PO and create a new one. You will not be able to create delivery addresses in here. You're going to be creating them when you do the REC or the PO. And so then, obviously, when you do that, they will get pulled into here when you post that REC or that purchase order. It'll say, oh, this is a new delivery address, and it will store it in here as well. OPUs, so not much to say here. Everything from Classic gets imported over, so really no changes. We just tell districts to look it over, make sure everything, or we look it over, and make sure um, that everything looks good. Uh, posting periods. So these are the posting periods that are out here right now. Obviously, um, what's highlighted in green is going to be your current period. So we, I like that feature, knowing right away what my current period is because it's highlighted. And then from there, I tend to look at, and I usually slide them over here, I look at the open and the current, 
I pull those over here so I can see, and usually what I really do is I go and put them over here. And if I want to, I can just click on a T for true to show me my open periods. Now, as you can tell, the only open period, which also happens to be my current period, is January. If I am doing requisitions for February or purchase orders for February, that has to be an open period. It doesn't have to be current, still be in January processing, but I can open February and allows me to go in and post transactions in that period. If I just started January, um, but I want to go back to December, um, then I can still, I can leave December open. I don't have to close it yet um, and still keep that period open and be working in January as my current period. So it really is a preference of the district. What I have done when I started um, with our districts is I treated it like classic just so they could wrap their heads around it. And so what I basically had in there is, okay, let's say they start <coughs> beginning of January, that's their current period, that's their only open period. Excuse me. So when they're done with January, they can go in here and close January and then open February. And then go in and process in February when they're done with their February, running their reports and things for the end of February, close February, open March. That's similar to what they had in Classic. After a while, they may start to, well, wait a minute, can I go and open this period to start? Yes, you can. They might get more comfortable with it, with the idea of keeping more than one period open. But obviously, they'll just have one period that is current. So you can have several open, but one current. So opening and closing, like the closing of a period, you could relate to adjust, you know, and say, okay, if you're ready to close a month, you'd click on the close option to close, and then obviously you would go in, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of the T here, and open up February, and um, then they could start processing in February. So you'll see on my test files that I've been playing around with some of these periods. Um, so I've got February was open at one time, and then I uh, closed it. Um, also July, I must have been doing like budget adjustments or, so, or not budget adjustments, budgeting stuff and had July opened for the next fiscal year. Um, so what's nice too is you see that information out here. So you can add as much information as you need to to the grid. So it shows the dates that it was opened or closed. Um, so you can see right now for January, I haven't closed it yet. I just haven't opened. So. I think that's just a notion of just getting kind of used to, um, you know, the flexibility of the system. Um, you may have districts that want to leave the periods open. Um, I would recommend, you know, closing them every month just to make sure that everything's, you know, set. Um, um, you know, just keeping with that fluidity of each month, um, but uh, it really is a preference of the district. Obviously you won't be able to close a year um, until all the other periods are closed. So if I was trying to close June and I still had February open, it's gonna tell me that. It's gonna say, wait a minute, you still have February open, you have to close out February 1st before you can close June. So the system does make sure that all the other periods in a fiscal year are closed first before you close the fiscal year. Okay, projects. Um, this is somewhat similar to your project to date amounts that you had in Classic. So in here, I really haven't had a whole lot of feedback from anybody about the project to date amount, so I don't know how much people are using them, but um, I believe what, was, what you had marked um, in 
classic should be imported over here. Um, so in here, you'll see that for these projects here, um, it's got the cash account that it's tied to and the beginning balance, the expended amount, what's been receded it, and the ending. So when you think about the way the project to date amounts were set up on the cash accounts in classic, um, it had that flag. Yes, are you gonna use project to date amounts? And then it had those calculations where you could put in a beginning balance if you wanted to. And then because that flag was tracked, then every time you did an expenditure receipt um, out of that fund, it would track those project to date amount uh, figures and then tally up and give you an ending balance. So I'm just gonna click on create here. And uh, I'm gonna give a name to this project to date, project to date test. And if I had a beginning balance, um, I could put that in here. So this is me making my own calculation. Even though, you know, I get this fund money in September, um, you know, my fiscal year falls from J July 1st through June 30th. But I'm not gonna get the money for this project until September. So I'm putting in what my balance was at that time. So let's say it was $5,000 and then Percent overrun, you know what? I just don't know off the top of my head what that is. <laughs> I'd have to look that up. Um, start and stop dates, obviously, if I don't want to do anything or allow any transaction processing to be against this account until uh, September, I can control that and click on save. <clears throat> and then what happens then, obviously, I'm like, well, you set up the account but what, or you set up the project, what's the account tied to it? That is underneath test. All right, totally forgot what I gave that name, project. I'm going to go find it. There it is, project test. Here is where I'm going to assign the cash account that it's tied to. So I'm not doing it in that create window. I'm going in here then and assigning the cash account. So obviously I do have a drop down in here. So I'm just going to pick on some type of grant account here. And I'm not sure if this just isn't working correctly for me or what. I'm just going to sign that one. And I got a kind of an internal error there. So I'm going to jot that down because I don't think that should be acting like that. <laughs> I'm doing something wrong, but I just want to write that down. But obviously, that's where I'm going to sign the actual cash account that gets tied to it. I'm just going to click on one of these other ones just to see if I get that same error. So if I change this and put in something different, I wonder if I get an error. It doesn't look like there, but I'm going to check that out. But um, that's basically what this is for, to assign project to date um, amounts for a particular fund in order to track those separately from, let's say, fiscal year time. Uh, the last one is vendors. And so um, vendors are almost the same as they were in classic. There are a few little differences. Um, and again, you can make the grid whatever you want. I'm gonna go ahead and just click on create to show you that the window looks different, um, but really, not really, you know, because everything's there. It's just that the address information is down at the bottom. So you still have your vendor information here. Um, we do have um, a configuration uh, menu out there that allows you to track your configuration numbers or your transaction numbers. It's called transaction configuration. 
and you can do that for vendors, purchase orders, receipts, so on and so forth. Um, and then it will go and look from that vendor and then default to the next vendor. So obviously, I can just leave this blank if I don't physically put in a number, and it's going to go out there and look to see underneath transaction configuration what the next vendor number should be. Now, a couple tips with this. I've had a few questions about this in tickets, is that people will call and say, it's not going to the next number correctly. And this is probably a question we get in vendors quite often. It's not assigning the next vendor. And that's probably because of the memo vendors that were used in Classic. We don't have, you don't have to use a 900,000 number for memo vendors anymore. That's assigned by the default payment type here. So this replaced the numbering system. So you can use vendor one, for a regular vendor, and you can use vendor two for a memo vendor, and that's called an electronic vendor in redesign. Um, so what's going to happen is when that data gets imported in, you're going to have vendors, let's say, 1 through 1,000 that you used in Classic, and then your next set of numbers wasn't until the 900,000 number because of your memo vendors. So you had from 900,000 to 900,010 that you used for memo vendors. Well, what's going to happen now is you go in to create a vendor in here, guess what? It's going to see your highest vendor was 900,010, and it's going to try to make your next vendor number 900,011. So, but you're like, no, my next number should be 1,001. So you have this big gap. So you have vendors 1 to 1,000, and then no vendors until 900,000. What you can do is, or what usually the ITC takes care of this, is under system configuration, there is that transaction configuration I was talking about, and you could go in here, and by default, they're gonna be all nines, and you can go in here and make this 1,000. So what happens then? is it goes out there and finds, um, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. You can make this 900,000. And what happens then is it goes out there and looks for that and doesn't see, um, that, and it goes out there and looks at it. It first looks here and then looks at that gap and sees when was the highest one, well, it's not it, 900,000, but the next available one, it goes backwards and looks to see that that 1,000 number was really the last one that you used, and it will sign 1,001 as the next available number. So I'm putting in where that gap was, the next number from that beginning of that gap, which was 900,000, and then when it goes in there to create the vendor, it's going to look and say, wait a minute, 1,000 was really the last one, and go from there. So it works slightly different than what it did in Classic. So that's something to keep in mind when they are figuring out their configuration um, for especially vendors. That seems to be a problem because of those big gaps that they may have due to those memo vendors. I'm going to go back to core and vendors. And like I said, click on create. Um, so like I said, those vendor numbers do not hold true anymore to the memo vendors, to the 900,000 number. It's by payment type. So um, any new vendors they create, um, they want to make them electronic. Any of those memo vendors that came over, the vendor number is still going to be 900,000 whatever, but the default payment type is going to say electronic for those memo vendors. So it's not like it's something that has to be changed. Um, it tracks your amounts. This is something new that we implemented near the end of calendar year end. You've got these taxable amounts and these total. So when you're running your 1099s, it's based off the taxable year-to-date amount. So um, if you wanted to go in and uh, make changes, 
you can do uh, vendor adjustments and adjust your uh, year-to-date amounts if you need to. So let's say, you know, you spent $1,000 to this vendor for the year, and only 700 of it should be on the 1099. Um, when you're viewing a vendor, there's going to be a vendor adjustments button up here, and you can go in and make a change and modify it so that the, attack, the taxable amount was really 700 and you can leave your year-to-date amount as the $1,000. Um, 1099 information's here. Um, what's wonderful about this is that you don't have to go in and set stuff. Remember with the SSN and EIN and Classic, you had to set that stuff in Venn screen because we didn't have those options in USAS Web? Well, we don't have to worry about that anymore. All of it is in here, and whatever it was set to in Venn screen, obviously, gets imported in here um, into the redesign. So any te uh, 1099 data that they had in Classic will get imported over. Um, the new hire information, um, so that's your new hire, your vent hire stuff. Um, and we do have a report out there where you could run uh, the vent hire. And it's gonna base it off of what's stored in here. Um, other information is just that. Um, it's like, kind of like that miscellaneous information that was in Classic. Custom fields, um, ACH. Um, so when it comes to like having true ACH vendors in the redesign, we don't have that implemented yet. But if you're using ACH with a third-party vendor, you can store that stuff in here. Um, so that information can be placed in here. And then what happens is that ACH information, you create the check, the XML file for the check, it's going to have this ACH information on that XML file, and when that gets uploaded into that third-party vendor like Edge, um, they'll be able to pull that in and create an ACH payment out of it. We do not have true ACH in just USAS yet. Um, but you can do it through your third party just like you're able to in Classic. Um, USPS integration, the payroll ID. Um, we'll talk about that more when we get into um, the pending transactions. Um, and then the locations down here. So your locations here, um, I'm sorry, I think we're getting a little bit of feedback here. Would mute, that would be wonderful. Um, so this is where all of your different locations are going to get imported in from Classic. So whether it's a per the PO address, the check address, um, that's going to get pulled in. Um, so obviously when you're creating a new one, um, you can put in whatever you want to call the location type. So if I know this is my PO address, I can type that in there, put in my address information for the purchase order, and check mark this flag and that's going to be pulled then on my purchase orders. If I have a separate address I want to use for checks, I can put whatever I want again for the location, but making sure that I have this check marked as well. And then you can also do a separate one for 1099s. And so what happens is, remember in Classic how you had to have the F1099 colon? Um, well, that, this kind of replaces that. Um, so you can check mark this, and then when it comes to the 1099 being created, it's going to use whatever address is that's checked under the 1099. And so, like I said, if you just had one address in Classic on a vendor, when this gets imported in, all three of these will be checked by default. But if you had a separate one for PO versus check, then obviously it's going to create two separate addresses. Okay, any questions about that? I'm looking here to make sure I don't miss anything on the chat. Okay, you guys are all feverishly writing notes, right? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and cancel out of this. And we're doing good on time. We've got the core menu pretty much taken care of. Before, um, before we start on transactions, I did wanna show you one more thing, sorry about that. Um, the advanced query. 
So in the advanced query, um, I don't know how often or how much everyone is really told the districts about the advanced query yet because there's so much just to grasp on just the grids alone and getting comfortable with those. But one reason why I would want to use advanced query is if I've got certain things where I want to query on something that I do often. Um, I don't want it to fill up. I don't want to pull that column onto my grid um, because I only use it like once a month. So instead of adding unnecessary columns to my grid, I'm going to create an advanced query filter and then go in there when I want to filter this information. So I'm trying to think of an example here. I know I've used one when it comes to um, 1099 vendors. So if I don't want to put the 1099 vendor information on here um, and pull it onto my grid, I can instead do a query on that. So I can go in here and underneath properties, I can select 1099 type and then one of the 1099 types is non-1099. And so what I'm trying to do is find everything that isn't a non-1099. I'm trying to find everything that is a 1099 vendor. So I want everything that doesn't equal non-1099. And then I can also say I want my year-to-date taxable to be greater than or equal to $600. So instead of filling up my grid with all of this stuff, I can create this query instead. And then what happens then is I can click on Apply Query and it's going to go out there. And I probably don't have any since I'm in January that has $600. <laughs> oh, look, I have one. Um, and so this went out there and found any 1099 vendor that has $600 or more in year-to-date taxable amount. And so what I can do then is I can save this query say these are my 1099 vendors, and click on Save Query, and it's going to remember that. And so when I come back in here the next time, I can go to Advanced Query and select this by going to the drop-down here, and then click on Apply Query, and it's going to pull up this information. And here, if I want to report, I've got my query results already. I can click on Report and pull this into a report and get what I want. So I think using the advanced query on things that you know that you're going to use often, but you don't want to fill up your grid with those columns. Instead, you want to make them an advanced query. That's, I think, why you would want to use this. I'm sure there are other cases too, um, but for now I think this is still very new to everybody. Um, I think we'll get more feedback later on this, but this is my example of using an advanced query. So any questions about that? What's nice with advanced queries too is I can save this query and then I can go in and create a report off of this query. Um, when you go into like the report manager into like a custom report, there's an option underneath configure filters section that you can apply a query that you've saved and pull it in. So it has all of my filtered data in here already. So this is my configure filters, basically. And I can pull that into that report and generate a report. So I can do it that way, or I can just go ahead and click on report here and save it that way. So lots of different options. All right. Try to think if there's anything else when it comes to the grids that I have not showed you yet. That one I was talking about with the uh, range here. If I put in 100 dot 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 to 1000 dot dot, I think, I don't know if that's going to allow me to do that on here or not. I don't think so. Did I put one too many dots in? It wants me to put a little bit more. 
Um, you will find yourself getting this as well, excessive query cost detected. It wants me to add even more information on here. It can't handle um, what I've had on here because it's over the query limit that it's looking at. So I would have to add additional um, filters in here in order to get the query results that I want. I know this is something that in the back of their mind, they know that this has to get improved, but this is what we have to do for now basically is go in and add additional things in order to kill this error up here. All right, well, um, I'll move on to uh, transactions here. And the way I'm gonna approach this, before I even start, any other questions about the core? Okay. Um, I'm going to approach this by showing you the expenditure um, options first by the expenditure process, you know, RECs, POs, invoices, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll go into the receipt information and then we'll move into all these miscellaneous things here. So I tell you what, this is so much better than the classic training we used to do. I don't think we even started on transaction stuff until like the afternoon. I mean, it's just, the redesign is so much easier with all of the um, uh, grid style format. You know, you're not going into a hundred different programs to show you things. So this training goes much faster <laughs> than it ever did in the classic programs. I just had to say that. So, okay. So when we talk about the expenditure process, you've got uh, requisitions. Um, the requisition legacy is going away. Um, we are removing that as the end of June 30th. So for those districts that are going to be starting up on the redesign of the next wave, and you have requisition users, they will, you will not see this option anymore. We had this on here in order to, um, I think for people to get used to, if they had a lot of requisition users, to get used to, um, uh, you know, still using the old Struts version, the old USAS web version, so that the treasurer staff didn't have to worry about training them all on the requisition uh, user interface. But we've made a lot of improvements to the requisition user interface, most notably uh, the account search. That was the biggest hangup, and I'll talk about that when we get into requisitions. But a lot of people, or some people, do not like the way to search accounts by typing in like 001-1100-511. They didn't like that. They wanted the old query search with the magnifying class that you had um, in Classic. Well, we finally got that into the requisition uh, user interface. So now there really isn't a reason why they really have to be using the old USAS web version anymore. We do have those same capabilities now in this requisition module. So that's, you know, the main reason why we are getting rid of this. Um, we're trying to remove all these legacy options. We removed the add deducts. We removed the refund legacy. Now we're removing requisition and we are going to be removing AP invoices soon. I have seen the um, new user interface for AP invoices, it looks great. Um, so we're trying to get rid of anything that's still looking at the old USAS web format and getting everything on a grid-based format. So, um, so that definitely is something, requisitions is something we'll be removing here at the end of the year. So if you're, you know, getting, thinking about training and stuff like that already for the next wave, those are things to keep in mind. So requisition users will need to be trained on the requisition module. So let's get into requisitions. And again, when you're in here, um, you'll see all of the grid-based uh, format and you'll see all the options over here. Now things have changed a little bit. Um, we're in the transaction module, so we have a few more um, additions in here. Obviously, you still have the view option and the edit to edit the requisitions. You still have the create. Um, you have a print option now. So obviously you didn't have any of that underneath core. 
um, the ability to print the recs, and the ability to, to uh, delete if you just created the requisition and you wanted the requisition deleted, um, you can do that. If you want to restrict that, we can write a rule to restrict that. So, and it just depends on their level of uh, access as well and what permissions they have in order to do that. One thing to keep in mind with the redesign, um, there is, you still have your standard identifiers, read only, rec only, standard, and group manager. So you still have those four, those all got carried over, but now you have the ability to go in and do custom roles with specific permissions. So if you have a specific you know, user that just does receipt processing, you can create a role for just receipt permissions uh, and that they'll only be able to, when they log in, be able to maybe look up revenue accounts and underneath the transaction menu, they may only see receipts or refunds or both. So remember that there is that flexibility. So again, I think, you know, when you're first getting districts on, um, unless they ask about it, you know, you can say this is what we have, they'll have the same access they had in Classic, but on down the line, you could create custom users with custom roles. So just something for them to think about. Okay, so creating a requisition. I'm going to go ahead and click on Create. And so we tried to make this very similar to what they were seeing in USAS Web. So we have the requisition number, and right now it defaults to that um, requisition number stored on the transaction configuration. We are currently in the process of creating um, requisition numbers per user, just like we had in Classic. So you can track the requisitions for a specific user. Um, instead of them having to write them down now and retaining them. So I'm thinking that's going to be going out soon here in the next release or two. So it'll be, you know, the ability for them to add requisitions and track requisitions per user. Um, but for now, like I said, it's a system-wide number unless they manually put something in here. So I'm just going to put in MRD100. And obviously the date. And then obviously a vendor here. Now, requisitions don't require a vendor. You can create a rule to require a vendor, but it's not something that has to be on here. So if there isn't a requisition or a vendor on this rec and you post the rec, it's considered a multi-vendor requisition. And this box will be checked when it's posted. Uh, because it, if, if it, there isn't a vendor, the system automatically assumes this is a multi-vendor, and then when the rec when it gets converted to a PO, and you leave the PO, the vendor blank on the purchase order, you post the PO, it definitely is still a multi-vendor purchase order now, and when you go in to invoice it, it will not let you post the invoice until you put a vendor in, just like it does in Classic. So once you put, enter in a vendor then, obviously then you can continue on with the rest of the invoice. So I'm just going to put one in here. You'll notice too, I can click on the down arrow and select. But when you think about it, you probably have a ton of vendors. So I can also do a search. can't type on my keyboard here. And I can use percent signs here as wildcards and I can surround them like I did in this example, and it's showing me any vendor that has the word Alma in it. It might be at the beginning, might be in the middle, or it might be at the end. And then I just select the one that I want. So I can search by vendor name, or I can also search by vendor number. I can just type in a number and they'll pull it down, or I can use a drop-down box. So my deliver um, address, so this is coming in from what we had when we were looking at the delivery address information. Um, and so I should have, I should have two, and then I've got, it looks like this one's labeled twice, I'm not quite sure why, I'll have to look into that. Um, but I'm going to select the test one, and so, because I had two of them checked, 
underneath my delivery addresses. Um, the description, this is the main description for the requisition. We have the same thing in Classic. Um, terms, attention, um, if I have my uh, approval, my workflow um, set, um, you're also going to see an approval status for workflows in here, so otherwise if you do not have that set, you will not see this option. Um, and so in here I'm going to go ahead and click on the plus sign here. and put in my amount, and you're going to see um, that you can split. So if I don't have anything to split, I just go in and start entering in my account code. If I do want to split this by quantity or price, I've got these options right here. Split by price, split by quantity. Um, I am just going to go ahead, I'm, I'm going to ignore those two for now, and I'm going to go ahead and put in, in a charge. So this is where I was talking about how we just added this not too long ago. We had this same lookup, account lookup option in USAS Web. And so this is one of the reasons why we're taking away the legacy option of requisitions because we have implemented this in the requisitions user interface. Um, so I could just go right over here and click on that and it's gonna bring up this little search box where I can go in and start entering in certain um, dimensions and it's going to go out there and find those, and it will display them. Um, and what's nice is it shows me the full account code, the description, and the remaining balance, so I know how much is left that can be spent out of this account. So just like it did in Classic. Um, I can also search instead of by uh, dimensions, by description, or by cross-reference code. And then I can just select the one that I want, and it will pull that in here. So that's one way. Another way, I'll show you the different ways you can enter stuff in here. So here's another way. I can start typing in 001 hyphen 27 hyphen 5, and I'm breaking it by hyphen for each dimension. So after 001, break, and then the first two digits of the function break, and then the first digit of the object. And you'll notice that it starts paring that down, filtering that down to just what I'm basically searching on, and then I just select the one that I want and pull it in. So I'm going to show you how to split. So if I'm splitting a price, obviously my quantity is going to be one, and let's say it's a copier and it's for $500, and what I want to do then is when I hover over these, it'll tell me which one's which. I want to split by price, so when I click on this, it's going to pull this up, and it says for item three, you're trying to split the price. So what are you trying to do basically? Well, 250 of it is going to go to this account, and then the other 250 and again I can do by percent sign and do a search on a dimension or on, on a description or I can start entering in with hyphens or I can do an account lookup any one of those ways to get the account that you need so here's my other one and then, so that's basically telling me now my $500 is matching my original price that I had put in down here. I'm going to click on Accept. And this is how it looks then. It looks like this on the actual requisition to show the split. And then I obviously I can do the same thing. And you notice too that it knows that it was a split by price and that's the only option I have available in here now. Um, and obviously split by quantity, if I do that. Um, so in here, I've got 10, and they're chairs. And so for, and they're, I'm sorry, they're $25 a piece. 
And so you'll notice, notice too, it's smart enough to know because I put in 10 um, that it knows that um, it's going to be a quantity split. And for this one then, five of them are going to go to this account. And the other five are going to go to this account. And again, I have my 10 here to equal the 10 there. I click on Accept. And here's my split by quantity. Um, some other things that you're going to see in here, you're going to see this in purchase orders and receipts as well, um, is the ability to reassign the, the sequence. Um, if I wanted the copier one to go to be item one, I could click on these up arrows to move that up or down. I also have the ability to add an item. So this is basically like an insert, to insert an item between items one and two. Um, also, you have the ability to copy. So what's nice is if you have like repetitive type of line items that you're entering in here, you can click on the copy feature, and it will pull everything from that item and pull it down to the next one. And then you can make any changes to it. So um, all those different icons are available, like I said, in, in those different transaction um, programs. And obviously if I want to get rid of something, I can click on X and it kind of gives me, it always gives me a confirmation. Are you sure you want to delete this? Yep, that's what I want to delete. And so if everything looks good, I can go ahead and click on save. And remember, you've got the create new and close in here as well. So if I'm doing, you know, 15 requisitions all at once here, I probably want to leave the create new. I'll just show you what it looks like. Create new and I click on save. And what's nice is that it leaves the window open and basically it's ready for me to do my next requisition. And it will stay like that. I showed you that before. We got out of here, went back in, and this was still checked. So if I don't want that to be that way, I want it to close out after I save it, I click on close. I can change these, so it's not a big deal. Any questions on requisitions? Okay, so um, in order to take a rec and convert it to a purchase order, um, you can go in and obviously, depending on what you have on your grid, on here I've got a converted um, field that I can pull in, and I can say converted equals false, and that tells me my outstanding recs. So you gotta think about that a little bit. Um, so obviously if converted was true, that means that it was already converted over to a purchase order, and you would see the PO number over here. But I'm looking for any outstanding recs, and again, I can be choosy here, and put in a certain date range. And I put that dot, dot in between there. And it's going to go out there and find anything within that date range. And another thing I haven't shown you yet is the ability to sort. Um, so I can just click on this to see from beginning to the end of the month the requisitions by date range. I can also say, well, within this date range, I want to sort by user, and the way to do that is when you hold down your shift key and click once on your mouse, you're going to get a second sort, and it should then sort by username. And then from there, I could, you know, hold down the shift key somewhere else and do a third sort. So I'm doing a sort within a sort, first by date range and then by username. Okay, and then I can just release those two if I don't, you know, want them. So let's say I am going to convert these first three here. And I'm going to go ahead and click on Convert. And so this is basically Mass Convert from Classic. And so I want to put in that uh, PO date here. I'll just put in 115. 18, and we're just going to let it default to the next available purchase order number. I click on post here, and it's going to go out there, and it's going to convert all those over. 
and um, this is good to see. So here's some errors, and I have that approval flag set, which I probably did when I was playing around with things. Um, and so it's not going to approve these because they weren't set to an approval status. Um, so I'm probably going to take that off because <laughs> you probably aren't going to use it much other than um, for maybe some type of third party um, approval system that you're doing. Um, so, um, but that's the reason why these failed is because of that approval status. Um, uh, for this one, it says the requisition has at least one item that does not have an account specified. So this is something that was sitting out there that's probably garbage rec that we did. Um, but it does explain why. So when in doubt, you have a pretty detailed reason why things aren't con getting converted over. So you can go right to that particular, you know, rec or whatever um, and look for the information as to why that's not working. I'm just going to pick on, I am going to take that off. <laughs> so I'm going to go to uh, configuration or modules here. And I'm going to disable this. So let me show you how that happens. Um, so in here, it's currently installed the classic requisition approval module. It was checked. And now I'm going in there to inactivate this. I don't want it installed anymore. When I do that, I won't see that approval information on the requisition anymore. So once that's got time to think here, it should tell me that it's no longer. So these are all of the modules that are out here right now um, that either came over from, um, that, were, uh, that came with the software or ones that you want to add to the software after you import. Um, a pre-encumbrance module is requisition, tracking requisition amounts, that's what that means. Um, USPS integration, obviously all you guys are moving over USAS and payroll, so if they're both moved over at the same time, you need to have this turned on after post-import in order to, once payroll gets posted on the payroll side, it then can get uploaded, like the auto post options in Classic, up it, it gets uh, carried over into USAS, and you'll go to the pending transaction option underneath transactions to post that payroll into USAS. So you notice that um, it's going to disable that now, and it come, goes back to a check mark, and it also unchecks the installed, but you'll notice this note in bold here. It says this change may not take effect until the page is refreshed. So I can either use my refresh option or here or click here to refresh the page. That way I know for sure now that that classic requisition approval module is no longer installed. So if I go back to transactions and I go into requisitions, And I'm going to pick on this MRD one here again. And first, I just want to view it so you can see that requisition approval information stuff is no longer here. So, and I should be able to successfully convert this now into a purchase order. And I'll go ahead and I'll convert the rec into a purchase order, and now I've got a different conversion result. It says that it's been converted. It does give me information about negative remaining balances, and this is something as well. It's going to tell you these things. There are some restrictions underneath user. Um, if you don't want things to go in the red, um, you can restrict that. Let me show you that here. I'm going to go ahead and close out of here. That requisition was converted over successfully, and you'll now see the PO that was assigned to it. So now the converted should say true, because I converted it over. It's no longer an outstanding requisition. And when I go into the PO grid, I'll be able to look up this particular purchase order. So I was talking about restrictions on accounts um, and being able to um, for one, restrict it from posting in the red. Underneath system, 
and underneath Users. And I'm just going to pick on the admin one here because that's what I'm using. When I view this, there is balance checking information here. And so in here, um, it's set by default that all three will be checked for user. But if the district wants to restrict people from posting to negative balances, then you can either um, uncheck those or if you just want always a warning to show, you also have that option as well. One other thing while I'm in here, since we were talking about requisitions, is there are these requisition prefix options here. So if you've got certain prefixes that you want certain users to use, you can put those in here. So I could put MRD if I wanted to. And then what this means here, this restrict requisitions, if this box is checked, the user will only be allowed to see requisitions with this prefix listed. So they're still going to post, it'll still restrict them to posting to those requisition prefixes, but if you also want to restrict them to just see those requisitions with those prefixes, you can check mark this as well. And I think, yeah, there is also, when I'm up in here too, I also get a little, we call these tool tips. And you'll see these quite often when you're hovering over fields in here. So this tells me that entering requisition prefixes here allows the users to see requisitions with the specified prefixes. And it also tells me that multiple prefixes can be used, but they have to be separated by commas. So entering prefixes without checking the box below will have no effect. So it's like you have to use one and the same here. So if I'm a user where maybe I work out of, um, I don't know, two different buildings or something like that. Um, and so for this building, my requisition prefix number is going to be MRD. But for this building, it's going to be ABC. Um, I can put both of those in there. And then obviously what happens is when I go in to look at my requisitions, I'm restricted to only being able to see those that are MRD or ABC. And obviously, I'm only going to be able to use those that are MRD or ABC. If I try to use something outside of that, it's not going to let me. So that's one way of keeping your requisition users to using a certain set of requisitions. So I've got, I've told you about this, I told you about the balance checking. While we're in here, um, since we're talking about requisitions and access, so this will allow, you know, them to post to negative balances or disallow. The other type of uh, restriction they have is on account filters. So this is another thing to think of as well, is um, whatever filters they had in USA Security, those will get imported in. So this same user, if this is a user that came in from the import, they're going to have the same username, and they're going to have the same filter set up in here. So if, you know, they were filtered to this 018 fund, then that's the same type of access they're going to have in redesign. So when this user is in doing requisitions, they can only use these type of prefixes for their requisition number. Those are the only ones they're going to be able to see. And when they go into create the rec and they go down to the line item numbers and go over to the account code, they're only going to see the accounts that, are, that belong to this filter. So again, if they had those filters set up in Classic, those will get carried over. So obviously these can be changed um, and those are stored underneath utilities. There's an account filters option where these can be updated. We'll get into that um, tomorrow or, or Thursday. Um, but that's where it's making the connection between the account filters underneath utilities and the user. It's based off this filter. And as you can see, yes, there's only one filter per user. We don't have anything. I know people have asked, can we have five or six different filters against that particular user? And no, at this point you can't. One filter per user. Um, while we're in here, just some other things that you're seeing, and we will get into roles later, 
but these are all the different roles that have either come from state software or roles that have been created. So um, obviously if this is a requisition user, I could give them rec only or read only. Uh, rec only is going to restrict it a little bit more so they only can see a requisition type of reports and things like that. Where read only will allow them to see like purchase order information and stuff like that where rec only won't. They'll just be able to see just the requisition interfaces. And um, down here too are just some controls and things down here. Um, password expirations, by default when I'm creating a new user or when I'm looking at an active user, it'll be checked as enabled. Um, account expired, password expired, these type of things. When was the last time that um, the user logged into here? So all of those options are available here. Um, if you've got um, a new user where you're going to force them to um, change their password when they first log in. So for example, if I'm setting up a new user account and when I do that, I create this user, I could put in today's date as the account expiration date. And obviously, I will create a temporary password through here. And then what happens is when that user tries to log in because I said that the, and, and let's say I give this to them tomorrow, because the password expired today, it will make them change the password. So they would have to, when you got to the home page, you logged in, you'll notice a change password link. They'd have to click on that to change that password to something permanent. That forces them. Otherwise, if you don't put an expiration date on, you're telling them, I still want you to go in and change your password to something permanent, but it's not enforcing them unless you, again, specify in here that the account's going to expire on this particular day. That's how I set up, you know, our users at first that came on the first time when I, when I did them last year. I put in account expiration, so I set up their accounts today with this expiration date of today. And then what happens is I mailed out, emailed them, you know, their username and passwords the next day. And when they went to log in, they had to change it first. They could not get in because it said password expired. And they had to click on, let me log out here, the change password link first, set it to something permanent, and then go in. One other thing too, when it comes to passwords and assigning, you know, the type of passwords that the district wants, that is, if every district can be different. I know right now, like in classic, um, I think it's, it has to be at least eight characters. And the way that that's set up in here, I believe is under configuration, I believe. Nope, under modules. Oh, maybe it was under configuration. Let me look again. I don't see it in here. Let's go back to Again, it must have just bypassed it. Payables, activity ledger, application. Oh, here it is. Yep. Um, password requirements configuration. So, what this is, is this will allow them by district um, if they want to um, change things. Um, the minimum length is eight characters. So, same thing that they had in classic. Um, so it has to be at least eight characters. And here um, you can put in, does it require numeric? So in this case, when the password's done, they have to have a number tied to it. Um, requires mixed case, there's lots of different things here. 
how long is the password good for? So I know some districts are like, we have to change ours every 30 days. Well, this can be up changed into something higher if need be. Um, so there are ways to change your password settings in here. Okay, I'm gonna move on to purchase orders here. We converted that rec over to a PO. And so this is our purchase order grid. So again, I can tweak this to whatever makes sense to me. And uh, one column that I think should be on here is the one called invoiceable. Um, that should be on there because it shows those purchase orders that are still considered um, outstanding that you still need, that you're still gonna process invoices against. So anything obviously that says false means that it's no longer an invoiceable PO. Anything obviously that says true, I can filter by that and just pull those up. I can create a report out of these outstanding purchase orders if I want to. Um, and then obviously I can change the um, columns that appear in here. And I, again, this is by user. So uh, user one's purchase order grid may look entirely different from user two in the same district. And so in here then, um, let's take a look at one of these purchase orders here. So I'm going to pick on the one that I did, this Alma Travel. And so I've got the ability just to view it. I also have the ability to edit it, um, delete. Um, I've got admin privs on, so, and that can um, be restricted, obviously. Um, printing and also invoicing it, taking it right to an invoice. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on view, see what the PO looks like in here. And so here is my purchase order. Um, and so in here, I've got these options up here. I can either edit this purchase order or amend it. So the big difference between this is Personally, I think most districts, if they did something by mistake, um, they just posted a purchase order and they realized the amount was wrong in this first one. It should have been 500 instead of 50. Um, I would click edit because that allows you to go in and make changes. You haven't sent it off to the vendor yet. You haven't you know, sent anything. You just created the PO and realized you made a mistake. So you can easily go into edit and edit that amount. Now, if this was a purchase order that I had already sent off and I need to make changes to it to reflect the new changes made to this, um, I can use the amend option. Amend will not get rid of those items. It'll cross them out and allow me to add them again with the correct information so that you can see, you got kind of like an audit trail as to what's happened to that PO because you've already sent it off to the vendor. This is my updated purchase order, my amended PO. And so it's gonna mark those off and it's gonna cross them out and allow you then to go in and add new items with the correct amount. So I don't know how often districts would use amend. I would think they'd probably use edit more often, but I just wanted to explain the difference um, on those. Um, obviously we have clone, so clone will allow you to clone a purchase order to a new one, just like it did in classic, and you also have the invoice option from here. I'm just gonna go ahead and click on edit, just so you can see what all is available here. Um, so obviously, if my vendor was wrong, I could go in and change that. Um, you also will notice the source. It, that's the requisition that it came from. So my requisition was MRD100. Um, you'll notice these options underneath here. We got invoiceable. This is invoiceable. I just created the PO. I haven't done anything with it. It's still an outstanding purchase order. Uh, Multi-vendor, if this had a blank, vendor here, that would have been checkmarked because it considers it a multi-vendor. Um, amended, obviously if I went in using the amend option, made some changes and posted it, that would checkmark the amend. And then the then and now, obviously that's not going to happen until after an invoice has been done. 
So if that invoice date was before the PO date, it would mark this purchase order as a then and now. And you can even, districts could even add that then and now um, field to the PO grid. And if the auditor said, do you have any then and now POs, they could do a quick filter on then and now equals true and bring up those purchase orders. So there is a way to easily track those. That wasn't the case with Classic. Um, and so down here, we have this amount area here that shows you know, what's remaining, um, encumbrances, what's been canceled so far, uh, what's payable, um, your total PO amount, and your total paid. So um, you could have like $850 is my remaining amount, but let's say I went in and filled 200 of that. So I have an invoice out there now for $200. That would show underneath the payable. So even though my encumbrance is still 850, I have an invoice sitting out there from one of these items for 200 so far. So that's the difference between payable and encumbrances. Um, also, um, everything here looks very similar to what we were seeing in um, uh, when we were in requisitions. So you have all of these um, areas here where you can go in and uh, view the information on that particular uh, item here. All right, so what I'm going to do, just to show you, let me pull on one of these here. So when I click on this view option, um, what this is, oh, wait a minute, this is the encumbrance impact. So, well, I've got to get this chat window out of here. This is brand new. We just put this out here on this last release, and this has to do with encumbrance impacts on imports. And it's showing me, well, no, this is showing me because this is one that I just did. So this is my impact on encumbrances for this item that I added in here. Um, I have to ask about this because I see them here, but I don't see them under my first two. It seems like it's only appearing on my splits. So it must show the impact of the 200 going 250 out of this 500 going here and here. I'm going to have to check on those. I'm going to ask about that, and I'll go back to these tomorrow um, to explain this a little bit better because I am not sure why they're showing here and they're not showing here. So I'm going to have to find out about that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and save this as it is. And I want to show you something else that you'll see as well. And now I see all of those impact on encumbrance the, on every line now. That might just be a problem where we didn't have those before when I was actually in the PO. What I was trying to show you guys was the status, and I'm not going to see that unless I'm in a view mode. Um, but when I click on that, it's going to give me, we used to have like a magnifying glass in USAS Web that showed us the same thing, and it's showing me the info about that item. Um, how much has been canceled so far? When was this item issued? what's been paid on it so far, and what's been invoiced so far on this item. So I do tend to use this quite often to look up something if um, a district calls and they have a question about um, an, a purchase order, I go to that particular item to see where it's at. So that is something I tend to use, and you can just click off of it to get rid of it. Um, you'll also notice when I went in to edit this and I went and then posted it again, um, obviously, it's going to give me those warnings because I have those set underneath my user um, to warn me of any negative amounts. Um, so any questions about the purchase order or being able to create a purchase order, there's really, it's very similar, almost identical to creating a requisition. Okay. So what I'm going to do is take this now and um, I'm going to, well, before we invoice it, let me show you amend, because I didn't take you through that. So if I click on amend, 
again, it opens up the purchase order here. Um, but you'll notice that I don't have the ability to go in and change like I did in edit. So I have to, I'm basically providing this audit trail because I've already sent out the purchase order to the vendor. I'm going to go in and this really should have been $500. I'm going to cancel that. And it's going to put a line through it. And then from here, what I can do is I can copy this item instead of, and it pulls it all the way down to the bottom instead of having to retype everything and put in $500. And then I'm going to go ahead and save the changes. And what it did is it took off. Oh, I got a message up here. Unknown entity posting period is null. It must not have liked the date that I put in here, but this is January. I'm in January. It's my current processing period. I should not have to put in. Let me try that again. I am not sure. I don't know why that's happening. I thought maybe I'm in January processing. I don't think I should get this. So I'm going to have to look into this to see if there's a problem with that. It should have just allowed me to because I am in January processing. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete this. And I'm going to try to add one instead of copying that to see if that's the problem. I shouldn't even have to put in a date here. And I'm going to put in 011005. That'll work. And now I'm going to try and save it and see what happens. And I left it blank on purpose. I think we just found a problem. So I'm going to write that down here to see what's going on with the amend. And I'll find that out then for tomorrow. I'll let you know what I find out. I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of here. But what should have happened, it should have posted this just fine. And you'll notice, though, that that item I was trying to amend, I can't, like I said, I can't change the amount. I'm showing an audit trail saying I am deleting this so the vendor knows this item has been canceled, and now I'm adding it with the correct amount so that they can see the changes that were made to that um, particular PO. So again, I don't know how often districts would use this. We did have the um, change order option in Classic that worked similar to this. Um, we did not have any amend type of option in USAS Web. You can only really amend your purchase orders in PO screen in Classic. Um, but we needed to have that capability in here in order to um, provide um, both of those options, amending and editing a PO. And so once a purchase order then is, is posted, I'm going to go ahead and invoice this. So again, I can do this from here, or I can do it from the grid using this invoice option. So I'm going to click on invoice. And you notice that it took us, oh, somebody had a question. Does the XML have the word amended in the file to be printed? I believe it does. I believe it's got something in there so that it shows that 
an amended PO so that the vendor can be can see the difference between that and the classic. Um, in here then, I'm going to go ahead and uh, type in an invoice number. I'm just going to put in test. And like I said, this is going to be changing. That UI is really close. That new uh, UI for invoices is really close to being done. So we won't see this old USAS web format much longer. And I'm going to go ahead and put in July. Now, we have an invoice date. We have a vendor's invoice date. Um, what we were coming up with, the problems we were incurring um, with when districts first started on this, is that a lot of them had um, invoices that um, they wanted to show the true invoice date from the invoice. So I had an example from one of our districts that here she is in January processing and she just got the invoice from the transportation director and it's two months old. But she just got the physical invoice from them. So she's in January processing. The invoice is showing an 11-1 date on it. She's like, I want my invoice date to be that November date, but you're in January processing now. So what we've come up with is allowing them, is adding this vendor's invoice date field so that they truly can put in the um, date that came from the vendor. Otherwise, if they want that invoice date on that to reflect here, they would have to go in and open up November again. So they have to open that period, enter that invoice, post it, and then reclose that period. So it's, either, it's one of those options. You either reopen the period so that you can put in the November date here, or you leave yourself in January and you put the vendor's invoice date here. So some districts were fine with that. They're like, yeah, I just need record of it. Either one of those is going to, if you're worried about then and nows, if this was something that was done before the PO was issued, both the invoice date and the vendor's invoice date is going to be looked at when it comes to then and now POs. Um, but um, so yeah, it's total preference of the district and what they want to do. But that's why we put this vendor's, vendor's invoice date in here so that they don't have to reopen a period that they've already closed. All right, so we got payment date, we got payment due date, which will always default to the current date. Um, I'm just going to change it to my invoice date. And then everything else down here looks very similar to what they were used to in uh, USAS Web. So I'm just going to click on this first one here and uh, just select this one and click on Fill Items. And it's just going to fill this particular one. And you'll see it also said it updated here. If this is the only one that I want to do, I can. Um, I'm also going to go in and uh, fill in my splits. So I could say fill here. And then if I wanted to, this second one here, I could, instead of using the fill all the time, if it really wasn't $50, it was $45, but it was supposed to be full, I can click on that as well. You'll also notice you have your receive dates. So you can put in a receive date. This was really received back in November or something like that. You can go ahead and put in 11.1 and click on this guy and it will carry it all the way down. Also, your EIS flag. So there is configuration screen out there. Um, underneath, I believe underneath system um, for the EIS information. So in classic, if you had on USA Con that you wanted both 500 and 600, you could set that up in here as well to pull any 500 or 600 object code that has a threshold amount of a specific amount. Um, and then what happens then, based on what was set in redesign here, 
um, it's going to go out there then and it's going to default these to yes if it meets those threshold amounts. So if my, all of these I believe were all 600s, oh, there were some 500s as well. 500, 580, I'm just using the binoculars here to see, 600s, yeah, 580s. So my EIS configuration screen must be set up to automatically include 500 and 600s. And my threshold, I probably don't even have one on here because it's pulling in everything. Um, for, you know, $45, so I must not have a threshold of like $200 or else this EIS flag would be set to no. Um, and so once I go in and post this invoice, I'm gonna go ahead and validate it first. And I'm gonna go ahead and post it. It is posted, all of those, and it has completely filled them all because I either filled them for the full amount or I put in, like for item two, $45, but it wasn't a partial, it was completely filled, it was just a different amount. That five extra dollars went back into my account. And so what you'll notice are these action buttons now. So it's telling me that right now you completely filled these. Well, let's say this item two, I really did not mean to fill it um, completely. I want to set that back because I want to do more invoices against it. My action button, this is going to change the status of this from full to partial. So it's going to allow me then to invoice this item some more. So you do have these action buttons and you also see one that says full. That means that you're going to change it from partial to a full status. So if you had one where you don't plan on filling it anymore, maybe they ran out of that um, inventory item and you just want to release the rest of the encumbrance on that item, um, then you can click on the full action button and it will release. Oh, somebody put me on... Uh, on hold here, so let me them off. I can find out, oh, never mind. Oh. Okay. And so that's what that, that full and partial action does. It allows you to go in and either reopen an item or close it. So let's say you had a purchase order where you've been filling it, maybe it's one item and you've been filling it every month and you have $50 left on it and you don't plan on filling it anymore. Um, it used to be that um, in Classic you would go in and create an invoice and cancel that remaining amount. So you would do a cancel full and, and to uh, officially close that PO. You don't have to do that anymore. I could go to that particular item and just click on the full action button and it would do the same thing without me having to go in and create another invoice against it. So that's what the full and partial will do. So I have completely filled this um, invoice and I don't plan on reopening any of these so my next step in the expenditure process is to go in and look at my payables. So my payables is going to give me what purchase orders or invoices that are out there that I haven't cut checks against yet. So this is kind of like invoice list um, in a grid. So it's going to show me all of my different um, invoices that are sitting out there that I have not paid against yet. So, and I should, looks like I just have this one that I did for Alma Travel. So I could have several here. And there's two different views. Um, there's a vendor view and there's a detail view. So my vendor view is by vendor. So I could have seven purchase orders out there against Alma Travel. And in the vendor view, I'm going to see the total amount of all of those purchase orders or invoices um, and the total amount of that. 
So if I wanted to um, see the details about all of those, I can click on the detail option and it's going to go out there and pull that, but it's going to give me all of the details. So it's going to pull all the line item information for every purchase order or every invoice that's outstanding. So for that Alma Travel, I had basically six items. I had two items and then two splits. Um, and so it's got everything in here. If for some reason I wanted to pay on only specific items, I could do that using this detail option. Or let's say I had those seven invoices out here, all for Alma Travel, and I only wanted to pay on the first six. I could check mark all of those, click on post selected, it's going to cut the expenditure, it's going to leave that one invoice for Alma Travel out there still. So that's what the detail option does. It allows you to select specific items or if you have multiple invoices out there for the same vendor, allows you to check on specific invoices and just pay on those. Whereas the vendor tab reminds me of classic. It's basically going to pull everything for that particular vendor all in one and you're going to pay off everything so you get one check against that vendor for all of those purchase orders. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just use the vendor one and I'm going to, and I only have one PO, obviously six items for that PO out there. I'm going to click on post selected and I get this post disbursements box. Oh, I'm sorry, I had a couple questions here. Let me go back to make sure. Is the partial button only on uh, new invoices? Uh, it, de um, it depends. Um, you will see, um, let me think about this, partial button only on new invoices. So if you go in and pay on that invoice, but you're only paying um, certain amounts, um, Let me think. So are you, I'm not quite sure, are you talking about like uh, you'll, your action button is going to be partial on that one? Uh, well, we're just not seeing it on classic uh, invoices that come from classic. Okay. So yeah. I wondered if it, you know, since it wasn't an option really in classic, to be able to do that, you know, you'd have to go to verify invoice or whatever to, to do that. Right. Um, that maybe it's not going to be on every line item in on the classic invoice that that migrates. But if that invoice is showing and you is still sh it still hasn't been completely filled. It should. Well, that's, that option and verify invoice is what we were trying to do where it says to delete the entire invoice. Mm-hmm. So that the purchase order is open again. Mm-hmm. Huh. Let me check on that, Deb. Okay. Okay. Right. I'm going to that down. Thank you. You're welcome. because that should be available as far as I'm concerned, but I'm going to check on that one. Okay. So going back, so when you select those items to be paid on is basically what you're doing. We checkmarked, post selected. It brings up a little summary box here saying, you know, you have one vendor, but we only had one invoice against that vendor for $845. And at this point then, I'm going to go in and put in my check date. And then I do have a grouping option in here. Do I want to group this by vendor or invoice? So most of the time you're going to be using vendor. But I think when, what happens is if the vendor requires separate checks for each invoice, you're going to use the invoice option. I think that's rare that that happens anymore, but if they're adamant that they want separate checks for each invoice, you're going to group this by invoice, and let's say I had 
six different invoices here, what happens is I'm going to get six different checks, six different dis disbursements. So they have a separate check for each invoice. Um, like I said, I don't know how often that happens, but um, they do have the ability to do that. They weren't able to do that in Classic. And here's where I was talking about the bank account. Um, so if I have those set up, and depending on which one I have marked as my default bank account, um, it's going to allow me to select then which bank account I want. And then at this point then, I'm going to go ahead and post this. So. What happens at this point is it goes out there and it tells you that it did post um, the disbursement is what it did, but there, and, it, and if I had any warnings about negative balances or anything like that, we would see that. Any fatals, um, we would see those in red and it wouldn't have been posted. But at this point, I can continue to print and what that means is going to take me to the disbursement grid and from here, what I can do is go in and assign a check number to that um, disbursement. It hasn't done that yet. It, it posted the disbursement, the money's been expended, but it has not assigned a check number yet until I get into the disbursement grid. So it's thinking, I guess. Usually it doesn't take this long. Okay, so here I am in disbursements, and what I tell districts to do is if they did like a series of payables here, posted all of those, go to the show printable and check mark that to look at your outstanding checks that you haven't created a check number against. So these, are, so these have all been expended on the system. I just need to assign a check number to it. And I'm just going to, I had some other ones sitting out here from other times. I'm just going to focus on my Alma Travel one here. And you'll know right away, I don't have a check number. It's blank. So anything show printable means I don't have a check number assigned to it yet. I want to assign a check number to this one. So I'm going to go ahead and check mark this. And I'm going to click on Generate Print File. That's where I'm assigning the check number. And again, we have in the configuration screen, um, the way to, to uh, it's going to track the highest check number on file. So what's nice is it tells me what that is, and I can just I can um, let it go, and I know that 95997 is going to be my check number, or I can overwrite it and put whatever I want in here. Um, the sort options, how do we want to sort it? I just have one check, so it's really not a big deal. Uh, but these are all the different sort options you have. You have the same ones. Um, in Classic, do I want to assign a check number to an electronic check? Um, we put this in here because we had a lot of districts that, I mean, you had to in Classic. When you did your memo checks, you had to assign a check number. They're used to that. They have a certain way that they sort and store those, so we're not going to argue with them. If they want to assign a check number to a memo check, they can. So what this is going to do then, when this is checked then, it's if this was an electronic check, it would assign the check number to it. And then you've got your print output file, XML or PDF. So obviously if you want an XML file here so you can pull it in to Edge or, or ABM or whatever, a third party, you can go ahead then and click on Generate. And what that's going to do is it's going to create the XML file and when you click on that, just to see what it looks like, I'm hoping it'll open up in whatever. I'm on a different workstation, so I have no idea what this is going to look like. Pull it up. And so just to give you an example of, you know, what this is doing, this is what the XML looks like. So based on your third-party vendor, um, there are certain things that they're going to look for in here. Uh, obviously, the physical check number here, they're going to use that. And then based off of what type of check this is, this is an accounts payable check. It knows if it's accounts payable, a refund, whatever. Um, and so whatever the third party vendor does to this, the printing um, company, they're going to pull what they need to off of here in order to create a check for 
um, the vendor. If I wanted the PDF version, I could do that as well. And it would just be, um, obviously, it doesn't have any signatures or anything on it, but it just shows you what the check would look like um, on the system. Um, so once that is, that's been posted, you'll notice it's no longer listed because I still have show printable check marked. So once I click off of that, here is my Alma Travel one that I just did, and you'll see the check number here. So in here, also you'll notice that it says printed equals true. That's another thing that indicates to me that I assigned a check number to it. I can also go in and view this check, and what I like about this is that it gives me right away down here the purchase order and the invoice that are tied to it, as well as the account codes. So I know we've had questions from people saying, well, what was my PO tied to that, or what account code did I use? Um, I think that view option is overlooked quite a bit, but they can just click on that and look to see what PO and invoice was assigned to that check. Um, one of my favorite things about this user interface are these options right up here, these buttons. Um, when you think about that, in Classic, you had what, four or five different programs that you had to get into to do these type of features. So obviously the generate print file is, you know, assigning the check number to it. Um, reconcile, so that's either the reconcile program or auto rec, um, or I'm sorry, just the reconcile program. Um, in Classic, unreconcile was an option within the RCN CLE reconcile program in Classic. You got auto rec, this has to be set up somewhere else first. Uh, before you can go in and use the auto reconcile option, you've got your void check and you've got your check sequence. So you do, you have one, two, three, three different options um, or four different options that are actually available right on the grid. So for this particular one here, if I wanted to go in and reconcile this, this is one way of doing it. I can go in and check mark as many of those based off of filtering and what's on my bank statement, and I can select what I want, put in a reconcile date, click on reconcile, and it will show that it's no longer outstanding. It'll show reconciled, and then if I have the reconciled yep, uh, column displayed in here, it'll reflect the reconciled date. So again, you're gonna be, you know, your end users are gonna be using these filters a lot in here in the disbursement grid. Um, you got unreconcile. So let's say I did reconcile that one and I, you know, didn't mean to. I can just click on unreconcile and it will take it back to an outstanding status. Void, um, if I click on void here, I get my void option. So I get void disbursement um, with the void date. And um, so I'd have to put in a January date there. And also I have a void invoice items here. So that is set by default to um, check mark. And so what that's gonna do is it's going to void the check and also cancel the invoice that's tied to it. Now, if I don't want that invoice to be canceled yet, um, I can just go in and uncheck this and when I click on confirm, it'll throw this back into the payables field or the payables program. Um, so I can go in and create a new check for it. So um, I guess a good example would be if they you know, created a check for something they weren't ready to yet. Um, they could go in and void this. They don't wanna cancel the invoice because the invoice is correct. Everything's fine with it. Um, so they would uncheck this you know, um, confirm, um, it'll throw it back into payables, and then when they're ready, they can actually go in and create the check again. That's one example. Another one is if they don't want to create a new invoice, they realize the amount was wrong, and they're gonna go in and uncheck this, confirm this, they could go back to the invoice in there, make changes to it, repost it, using the same invoice number, 
So they're just editing that invoice, saving it, shows up in payables, and then they can create a new check against it. So, but if they want that invoice to be canceled, they want to show it to be canceled because they want to generate a new invoice for it, then they want to make sure that this void invoice items is checked. And this is how Classic behaved. It voided the check and canceled the invoice all at once. So it's just total preference of the district, but I think, you know, just want to make them aware of what happens if you do uncheck this. What kind of options do you have? What does that do in the system? So it throws it back in payables is what it does. They could go back to that invoice, edit it, make changes, repost the invoice. It's still in payables with the new updates and then they can generate a new check. Um, resequence is your check sequence. So um, you've got uh, the way to go in and option one of check sequence is going in, entering your old um, number range, entering the beginning number of the new range, and clicking validate and post. It's going to resequence those numbers. If you want those old checks to show as voided, which was option three in check sequence, you would enter in again your beginning ending and then your new beginning and check mark void old checks. Those old checks here on this range will be voided on the system um, and then obviously assigned to new numbers. So option one is leave this unchecked. Option three of check sequence is to mark this as checked. And obviously option two of check sequence you have to do after you make these changes, go back in then, find those ones that you resequenced and use generate print file to generate a new file. Um, one thing to keep in mind with that is that you've already resequenced the numbers. So when you're going to generate print file, you're not going to be putting any um, starting number in there. It'll know what those numbers are already because they're already on file. And then you just click on generate and it will pull those numbers that are already on file for those checks. That was another question we had too with somebody is, you know, I did a check um, and I need to regenerate the check um, by just, you know, you're not going to be signing it a new number. You're going to click on that one click on generate print file, you can leave the start number blank because it knows that you already have a check number and then click on generate and it will generate a new print file. Okay. Let me think if there's anything else in your, oh, I know what I want to do. I want to wrap up with the auto rec um, option here. So, like I said, you have to set this up before they start using AutoRec, and that is under the utilities. There's an automatic reconciliation, so you do have to go into another program, but I'm telling you what, this is so much better than setting it up in an INI file in Classic. Oh, I, I did not like that. Um, so this is much easier to use. So basically, it's asking you what type of format is coming from the bank. Is it a CSV or sequential fixed length format? So if it's a CSV format, then um, basically, you know, because this district, let's say they used AutoRec and Classic, you already know that the check number is in column A and the check amount is in column B. So you basically set it up the same way in here and it's so easy. You just go in and say check number, column A, amount, and you got two different amounts, explicit or implicit. So implicit is implying that there is a decimal. There really isn't, you're just implying that. So if you're bringing this over from a CSV file and there are no decimals in here, obviously you're gonna use the implicit. And the explicit does contain decimals. Um, so my check amount, whatever that is. And so basically column A is my number, Column B is my amount. Um, the date, I know we had a lot of people saying, well, what about the date? Because 
Right now, when I try and select date, it's split out um, into month, day, and year. Um, well, what are you using the date for? They kind of have to think about that. You're not using that date that's coming from the bank. When you reconcile your checks, you're putting in a date at that time. So all you're really doing is pulling in the date that it cleared the bank, but you're not going to be storing that anywhere in USAS. So these really are FYI type of options. You're not going to be using these. It's not going to be looking at these at all. It's going to be looking at your check number and your amount and making sure that those match from what's on this CSV file to what's in the redesign. Um, one other question we had from people is, okay, when it pulls over from my bank, I've got an account number in the first column and then the check number and then the amount. So how do I get that to line up correctly? Ignore. Check number, amount. Done. That ignore column is going to ignore whatever is in that column. So if, like I said, the account number is on that first column, but you have to make like a, basically a space, um, you're going to choose the ignore. So it's going to go right to column B on your CSV file and say, oh, there's the check number and match it up with what you see in here. So once I have my format set up, I'm going to go ahead and save this. And when I click on save, um, format name, um, Sampleville Bank, click on save, and it tells me that that format has been saved. And if I want to look it over, I can click on it, load it up there if I had several different ones for some reason, and review it. I can make any changes that I need to and update the changes. Um, so really this is going to be kind of a one and done thing. It's going to be something after import and stuff before they start reconciling checks that you're going to go in and help them set up. Um, so once this setup has been saved, then when they go back to disbursements, Then when they go in and select that one, there's an auto reconcile option and they're going to put in whatever date they want to use for the reconciliation date. And then the auto rec format, Stampable Bank, that's the one I just created. Um, the bank account, um, if they, you know, choose to, to uh, select a bank account. And then here, underneath Choose File, that's the CSV file that's sitting out there that, you, that they pulled in from the bank. So you would choose that file, load that in, and click on Upload, and then it's going to go out there. <coughs> Excuse me. It's going to go out there then and reconcile those checks that are on that CSV file with that 131.19 date. So it's going to go out there, compare it to you know, what's sitting out there on file, and then um, add that reconciliation date. And that's it. That's all there is to it. So again, you know, this auto reconciliation is a one-time setup, and then from there, once they have that, they're good to go to start auto reconciling their checks. So much better than INI file. Okay, well, I think we've done enough for today. I was hoping to get halfway through the um, transaction menu, so we got through the expenditure process. That's good. Um, so tomorrow we're going to finish up uh, the transaction menu. I'm going to um, address these questions that we had um, and some of these errors that I saw, um, and I'll let you know what I find out from those. And then we're going to move on then after we get through transactions and go into the budgeting. Um, I'm going to refer to um, the step, the, the list that we, checklist that we have in, in the appendix on how to do that. And then we'll also um, start in on the periodic menu. Um, before we hang up, just to show you where some of this information's at, under the USSR documentation in the USSR manual, we do have an appendix 
and I have to be honest with you, it's been a while since I've looked at some of these, so I think some of these things do need to be updated, but we have like a how-to process guide where when it comes to like the expenditure process, we've got requisitions and purchase order processing. And basically, it's for the end user. It's a step-by-step -step on what they need to do to get through posting a requisition, a purchase order, an invoice. So you guys, please take what you can from here. You can take these and I can click on this and export it to a Word document if you want to go in and tweak some of these. Um, or you can export it to a PDF if you think it's fine. Um, and then you can give these to your end users to say, I know it's a little daunting, you know, when you're kind of looking at the overall picture, but just follow these steps to process a PO. We tried to make it as simple as we could for them. So these are all out here, and we haven't, we haven't added any in a while, so I know we still need more to do, but, you know, the expenditure and receipt type of processing and um, information's out there, everything I just went through with disbursements and how to avoid resequence and reissue, that's all in there. So these are things to be used um, for the end user. Like I said, tomorrow when we get through the budget, when we start on budgeting, we'll go through these budgeting scenario steps and talk about how to create budgets and stuff like that. So, okay. Well, I think we're done for today. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, for listening in. And like I said, tomorrow we'll finish off the rest of this and get going on budgeting and see how far we get. And then we'll wrap everything else up on Thursday. So we'll see you tomorrow at one o'clock. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks. And I hope you feel better. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.